ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Is this volume? No? Can we... Can everyone hear me now? No? Can we get the volume up on this mic? Hello? It's not great. Yeah, um. Is someone able to control the volume on this microphone? Is that better? Great. Everyone can hear me now? In the balcony, can you hear me? Yes? Great. Okay, let's get started. It's Monday, May 13th, 2024, and I'm calling to order night six of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. First, a reminder about the article sequence for tonight. First, we'll take Article 17 off the table with the meeting's permission. Uh, it was waiting for the special town meeting to finish, which finished last Wednesday, of course. Then we'll take articles 8, 9, and 10 off the table. And finally, we'll be back to the normal sequence of articles resuming with Article 31. Next, a reminder that announcements and resolutions are not open mic night for criticisms or grievances. I received feedback in about, about an announcement last week, which I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, but if you attend committee meetings, public hearings, or public forums and have issues that you'd like to raise, Announcements and resolutions are not the appropriate place for that. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then consider yourself lucky and move along. Next, instead of saying yes or no for voice votes, we're going to use yay and nay so that they're the same vowel sound. Based on my totally unscientific research, the word no is significantly louder than the word yes. Apologies in advance for when I inevitably forget and revert to asking for yes and no. I'm sure someone will correct me when that happens. <laughs> Lastly, going forward, when I open the speaker queue ahead of a proponent's presentation, I will try to announce the first two speakers from the queue who will follow the proponent. That way, all the speakers, including the first one, will have some advance notice to afford them time to move closer to a microphone. I don't see the signs on the seats. I think we lost those when we broke down uh, uh, the setup since Wednesday's meeting, but uh, there are some open seats in the front row, so please find those when uh, you're called as the next uh, on-deck speaker. Uh, that's it for announcements tonight. Everyone, please rise for the national anthem. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 15th, 2024 at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor of when we, if we adjourn tonight instead of dissolving, 
um, that will readjourn at uh, Wednesday at 8 p.m. All those in favor say yes. Uh, all those, you got me, you got me. I didn't see that coming. Uh, all those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. <laughs> we'll be readjourning on Wednesday, unless you finish tonight. Okay, let's take a, a test vote. Okay, and the test question is, will town meeting finish this week? I remind you, this is a non-binding vote. Okay, get your votes in. Let's close voting. And the meeting has resolved that we will finish this week. Um, so let's cycle through those votes so everyone can check their votes. Okay, and while we're waiting for those screens to go by. Uh, are there any reports of committees? Yeah, I see uh, Mr. Thielman, but first, uh, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Second. Okay, we have a second to remove Article 3 to receive reports from the table. All those in favor say yay. yay. All, the, all those opposed say nay. Uh, is there a no? Uh, we're, Article three is off the table. Um, and um, Mr. Thielman? Uh, after the meeting approves it. Oh, okay. We'll try to streamline this with the procedures committee because it's all kind of silly, but go ahead. I move approval of the high school building committee report. Second. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. Okay, it is received. You wanna get that up on the... Great. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Jeff Thielman. I'm Precinct 12 and the chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee. You can learn a lot about the project by going to our website, ahsbuilding.org. I'm going to give you a brief overview of where the project stands at this time. Um, and I want to thank the residents of the town of Arlington and town meeting for your support of this project. Without you, we would not be where we are today. Next slide and the next slide. The high school continues to be on budget because we locked in prices for all costs of the project in 2020 and 2021. A reminder that 29% of the funds for the new high school come from the Massachusetts School Building Authority and 71% come from us, the taxpayers of Arlington. Next slide. This gives you an overview of the phases of the project. With the opening of phase two, three quarters of the new facility is now complete and all primary learning spaces now reside in the new building. Phase three construction, the athletics wing is underway. We anticipate completing this phase in February of 2025. The entire project, including two additional lighted athletic turf fields, a connection to the Minuteman bikeway, and parking lots is scheduled to be completed in the fall of 2025. Next slide, please. Phase two was the largest and most complex of the four phases with 44 classrooms, the cafeteria, the forum stairs, and the library. Phase two also includes the new district offices, a multi-purpose school committee room, and the district's welcome center. Finally, with the completion of phase two, we welcome our Mononymy preschool students back to campus. For those of you who uh, don't have students that age or don't remember them, that this is the town's integrated program for three to five-year-olds, providing state and federally mandated inclusion-based education. The next slide is of the forum stairs. This is a view um, which connects the student center, cafeteria, and field entry of the school. One side is a staircase with access to the cafeteria. The other has high risers for gathering and collaboration. The next slide is the library, which is centrally located within the student center and adjacent to the STEAM and humanities wings. The library provides a flexible and inclusive space for teaching and learning. Next slide is a view of Mononymy Preschool, which has eight classrooms, a two-story multi-purpose room that functions as a gymnasium, and a space where physical and occupational therapy services can be provided, and two daycare rooms for, ch for the children of Arlington Public School staff. 
The next phase <clears throat> um, gives you an overview of what we're doing now, the athletic wing, which also, and also includes a black box theater and spaces for the lab collaborative. That's a collaborative for special education of different towns in the community and Arlington Community Education Offices. The next slide is an aerial view of the project uh, as a phase three as of just a few weeks ago, and that's a view from Schuler Court. The next slide is a view of the gymnasium. That's our 16,000 square foot gymnasium. It includes a walking track and is large enough to fit the entire student body for assemblies. There's two additional PE spaces, one of which will be a fitness center, and the other will serve alternative PE programs such as dance, climbing, and yoga. Also, our 30 athletic teams will be using that space. The next slide is a view of our outdoor amphitheater, uh, which is adjacent to the performing arts wing. This is where we'll have outdoor events, classrooms, uh, activities, uh, and performances. At the end of that rectangular view inside the building is the 3,000 foot, a square foot drama classroom or black box theater that can be used for one act plays, theater classes, and productions. Next slide, in January, we hosted uh, tours of the space. More than 2,000 people came. We appreciate you uh, coming and seeing the space. Uh, if you have not been uh, to the new building, you can take a virtual tour on our website, or you can sign up for a community education class because many of those courses are taking place in the high school. Next slide lists the members of the committee. We're grateful for the opportunity to serve you. We've been at this work for eight years now, and uh, we'll see this through to completion in 2026 when we do the final punch list. Thanks very much for your time and support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Any other reports of committees uh, in the front row? What is the uh, permit? Uh, so all the, uh, do we have a second for receiving the report of the Permanent Town Building Committee? Second. second. All those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, town meeting members. Um, could I request an additional three minutes, which I will probably not use if I move as effectively as Mr. Thielman did? Okay, so we have a request for an additional three minutes on top of the uh, 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 usual four, so that would be a total of seven minutes. Uh, we have a second. All those in favor of extending a total of seven minutes uh, uh, for this report, say yay. yay. All those opposed, say nay. It is approved. You have Great. seven minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. So the Permanent Town Building Committee is the committee that is charged with managing major construction and renovation projects with certain exceptions such as the Arlington High School Building Project which uh, Mr. Thielman just, uh, just described for you. So the, the committee is a nine member committee. We have, uh, we have five resident members and then four designees on the committee. We meet twice a month throughout the year, and as I said, we handle the major building projects for the town. Uh, the current projects that we have under our purview are the renovation of the Central School, which I've reported on in prior meetings, and the, uh, the town yard. Let's uh, take the next slide, please. So the, the uh, what's called the Central School, Community Center, Senior Center, uh, so this project has been underway for a number of years. We are, I'd say, like 99.999% complete on this project. It's really just a, a couple of last little crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Uh, but the building has been in full use for some time now. Um, if you have not been over there recently, I would, in, or in the last couple of years, I would encourage you to do so. Um, let's go to the, let's just go on to the next slide. Um, so the major project for, for the building committee this year and, and the last couple of years has been the town yard project. This project is a, close to a $47 million project. It, um, it involves the renovation of, of four historic buildings on the site as well as the construction of one very large new building on the site. And uh, at this point, the, uh, the, the project it is meeting the goals of the building committee in, in at least two senses right now, that it is, it is um, a very high quality project, and I'm gonna show you some slides that, uh, as, as Mr. Thielman did for the high school, I, I want you to actually see what we've been able to create uh, at this 
what is really a very difficult site. Um, but we also intend to bring our buildings in on time and on budget. Now, starting a building during the pandemic is a challenge in and of itself uh, with supply chain issues, um, just a, a myriad of issues that we find underground at this, this uh, very challenging site. And also, we all also intend to bring the project in on budget. And that as of right now, we are uh, within 1% of our budget. So let's go ahead and take a look at some uh, pictures of the site. So this is an overview of the site. On the left-hand side, you can see the four historic buildings, which were all renovated as part of this project. And to the right-hand side, the major new administrative building plus the, um, the vehicle repair and, uh, and shops areas. Next slide, please. Um, so these are just a, a couple of uh, sort of views from uh, at the top, the views from Grove Street of the historic, what we call Building A, the old uh, Arlington Gas Light Building, which has been um, pretty much completely done now and is occupied by the Facilities Department, IS, and, and so on, which IS was relocated from the high school. Um, on the lower pictures, you see a new connector that was built, lower left, the new connector built between that building on Grove Street and what we call Building B, so that you now have interior access from one building to the next. And then on the lower right, uh, an example of a workshop area that was, uh, that was completely renovated, you know, new, new flooring, new, uh, new guardrails, and so on. Next slide. So uh, here are a couple of the other buildings that we're working on. The upper left is what we call Building C that has now been um, turned into completely a uh, vehicle storage facility. Uh, this building required a, a, a new roof, uh, you know, cleaning out drains and, and uh, report, in, as in every one of the buildings on this site, replacing all of the uh, mechanical and uh, electrical, plumbing, uh, HVAC uh, uh, systems. On the upper right, you see uh, the building that uh, I think you may recognize, the one that has uh, sort of a terracotta roof, a very uh, Italianate uh, kind of style to it. Well, this is a, a, a big new opening that we made in a wall in that building to allow vehicles to pass through from one side to the other in this building. And then in the lower uh, picture, this is an example of what you just run into in these buildings, uh, that things that we just could not have foreseen at the beginning of this project. In this case, um, window frames that are bent, uh, steel beam in the wall that is, uh, is corroded, um, lintels that are basically falling apart. So uh, we knew we had to replace the lintels. We could see those, but we didn't know about all the other stuff. So these are just some of the things that are contributing to the challenges we've had in, in, uh, in terms of meeting our budget, but also our, our uh, schedule for this project. Uh, next slide. Um, here's the new salt shed on site. Um, those of you who have uh, heard, wherever he is, Mr. Trembley ask every year how much salt gets used, um, I, I, I'm sure that Mr. Rademacher will, uh, will enjoy having Mr. Trembley come and find out how much salt is used every year. But this is a new salt shed that was built on the site. Next slide. And here is the, the, uh, the main new building that was built. Uh, new buildings are a whole lot easier than uh, renovating old buildings in that there are a lot fewer surprises. Uh, here's a view from Grove Street on the left. Uh, on the right, uh, some of the office areas, stairwell. Next slide. Um, upper left, uh, an area where all the foremen can now um, do all their scheduling activities and find out the status of the work. Uh, in the right, in the upper right, the, a new muster room where you can have major staff meetings. Uh, people can be deployed from this. It can be also used for handling uh, emergency situations. In the, uh, the lower pictures, this is really sort of the, the guts of the uh, utility rooms showing the uh, heat pump water heaters, high efficiency uh, gas boilers. And next slide. And then this is really sort of the, the basis of this new building, uh, vehicles uh, repair areas, uh, a new wash area that will extend the life of the vehicle significantly. Um, so that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you, and uh, I will be available for questions. Um, if anybody has any, uh, they can certainly reach out to me. Just go to the website for the Permanent Town Building Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reedy.
we have any other reports of committees? Yes, uh, Ms. Stamps. I move that the I move that the uh, report of the tree committee be admitted. Okay, we have a second to receive the uh, report of the tree committee. All those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. It is unanimous. Thank you. Um, what I really want to emphasize right now is I'll tell you about our activities this year, but. Um, it's kind of the same activities as other years. We plant trees, we try to save trees, we water trees. Um, and, uh, but what I want to really talk about tonight is the town's Adopt a Tree program. And um, we started it several years ago because um, just like the town asks residents to shovel the sidewalk in front of their house and clear the leaves off the storm drains, et cetera, the town just can't do all the work that really needs to be done in town without the help of the residents. And watering the trees is, um, is the same thing. We have greatly increased the number of trees we're planting in town um, to the benefit of the town and the environment, but it's very hard for the town to keep up with it. Water trucks break down, it's hard to get you know, people to work, and especially in the summertime when it's needed sometimes twice a week in the hot weather. So um, we did start this Adopt a Tree program during COVID. Actually, the planning department started it. But the tree committee has basically been running it. And um, it, it's really cool The town, you may know that the town has all these GIS maps of the town, and including there's a tree map that shows that was started with the 2017 tree inventory, and the tree warden keeps it up to date. Every time he plants trees or removes trees, he updates the tree map. And then the GIS coord uh, coordinator, Susan Brunton, actually every year when he finishes the planting um, and updates the map, then she, uh, she creates a separate tree adoption map so that it only shows the trees that have been uh, planted in the previous three years, which are the ones that need to be watered. Um, you can get to that map through the DP, through the, the website, uh, the town website. Um, just put in adopt a tree to the, for, where, I don't know where I am on time. Oh, okay, make it quick. Um, it's easy to find on the town website um, through the DPW page or go to arlingtontrees.org. That's the tree committee website. Um, but we, we'd really like to step it up a notch. Right now we're only getting about 10% of the trees watered by volunteers. We'd really like to increase that a lot. So I thought, well, why don't I, we ask town meeting members because we're very civic minded or we wouldn't be here. So we um, got the idea to see if we could find one person in every precinct to be the tree adoption coordinator, basically. Doesn't mean you have to water the trees, you don't have to go around knock on doors, but if you notice a new tree, and maybe you, could, maybe you know the person who lives there, and you could knock on the door and see if, if they might water the tree. But at any event, I'm putting this in the back, um, and hopefully, we've already got a few sign-ups. Hopefully, you guys can um, si sign up to be the uh, tree adoption leader in your precinct. Well, in the last 45 seconds, I'll just report that, um, again, the town is planting about 300 trees a year. Um, we're starting a very exciting new program that we can do under state law. Uh, we're going to be starting planting on what's called back of the sidewalk, which is between the sidewalk and the uh, resident's house. It, uh, as long as it's within 20 feet, it's okay. And uh, Mike Rademacher, uh, has, which we're very grateful for, he has given us the green light to start this program if we can find 25 good locations. So be on the lookout for good locations and email the tree committee. Um, other than that, we're very involved in various statewide tree groups and also with high school students, and I think that's all we need for now, but please sign up for the uh, Arlington Trees Google Group and uh, check out the Tree Committee website, which is really cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stamps. <laughs> Any other reports of committees? Yes, uh, Mr. Dutulio.
Jim DeTulio, Precinct 12. Uh, Smart Area, move acceptance of the Artificial Turf Study Committee report. Okay, do we have a second? Okay, all those in favor of receiving the report of the Artificial Turf Study Committee, say yay. yay. All those opposed, say nay. It is unanimous. Mr. Moderator, I move uh, that we get an additional eight minutes beyond the traditional four for this presentation. My justification briefly is that this is a major issue. Uh, this was, we spent hours on this at last year's town meeting and we're all only seeking a mere 12 minutes to talk about all the work we did. And we were specifically supposed to report to this town meeting. We hope to not use the 12. Yeah, it was debated for, I believe, four hours. Yes. Um, <laughs> over two nights. Um, and so a total of 12 minutes, 12 minutes. Yeah. 12 minutes. Um, all those in favor of extending the speaking time to a total of 12 minutes, say yay. yay. All those opposed, say nay. Yay. It is approved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm going to turn it over to the clerk of the committee, Natasha Wade, to kick us off. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, so Natasha Waden, uh, Public Health Director and Clerk of the Artificial Turf Co uh, Study Committee. Um, could you move the next slide, please? Just going to recap, the Artificial Turf Study Committee was um, established at last year's Springtown meeting uh, through an amendment to Article 12. And as outlined in the amendment, the charge of the committee was to review and report on artificial turf, but more specifically, its health, safety, and environmental impacts, potential mitigation measures, and to make a comparison of artificial turf to natural turf fields. Next slide, please. Uh, Jim and I would like to acknowledge the uh, committee members. Um, and if any of these folks are here, we ask that you just briefly stand so that we can recognize you. Um, as outlined in the amended article, the committee was comprised of nine members, two of which were non-voting members. It was an honor and pleasure to serve with these committee members, uh, these, these individuals who worked very hard and diligent, diligent over the, uh, a, conden a very condensed period of time. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jim DeTulio, who was appointed by the select board, served as the chair, and was a voting member. Uh, Myself, we don't need to do that. Um, Mike Gildesgame, who was appointed by the Conservation Commission and served as a voting member. Joseph Barr, who was appointed by the Capital Planning Committee, served as a voting member. Jill Krajowski, I'm sorry if I said that incorrectly, uh, appointed by Envision Arlington and served as a voting member. Marvin Lewinton, uh, appointed by the town moderator, a voting member. Leslie Mayer, appointed by the Park and Rec Commission as a voting member. And the two non-voting members uh, were the Recreation Direc Director, Joe Conley, and Conservation Commission Agent, David Morgan. I'm trying to keep myself on time here. Next slide, please. Uh, so the timeline. Just briefly, um, as I mentioned, the first meeting was held in early December, and from there, roles were assigned, and the group uh, determined the best way to complete the work would be to break up into smaller groups, uh, which we will talk about in the next slide. The committee met 15 times over five months, and this is where the research topics were identified. Uh, speakers on various topics were presented to the committee, and where draft reports, narratives, recommendations, findings, all of these things were uh, discussed and edited, and community input session was held uh, for the public to comment on the draft report. We are happy to report that we were able to submit this uh, report in early April to the select board. Next slide, please. Um, in speaking about the working groups, um, each of these groups, we, we identified three, environmental, health, and safety. Each group was made up three committee members, and this is where the topics were discussed and the literature review of materials took place. Um, at each committee member meeting, the working groups would report out to the larger committee about the process uh, with multiple opportunities for the larger committee to discuss and review the various topic items in each of the groups. Each group then produced a narrative report for review by the committee, and that's where we began drafting uh, a report that was then circulated, um, edited many times, and, public, and we suck out, so, sought out excuse me, uh, public input. So... At this time, I'd like to turn it over, uh, if you could move forward to the next slide and turn it over to Jim. So the committee put a strong emphasis, there's many, many studies on artificial turf. We put a strong emphasis on government-funded, peer-reviewed studies. We read all the studies, but that was where we put our greatest emphasis, uh, trying to avoid studies that had potential bias. Uh, but the science is always evolving on this issue, and even the studies we read and the report we've put out is a snapshot in time. And for example, just days after we finalized our report and published it on April 12th, 
Uh, the EPA came out with a, a long-term study they've been working on for years, literally came out four days later, about one aspect of artificial turf. So this is a long way of saying, you gotta keep following this issue. We did our part, but this is an always evolving, always changing issue. So in the limited time that I have tonight, in the remaining eight minutes, I'd like to just kind of walk you through the report and our findings and recommendations. I can't really do justice to what each of the working groups did, so I'll give a very high level summary. I urge you to read the report. You know, it's a 34 pages, 100 footnotes, four pages of references. You can tell this committee really were superstars and did a ton of work in a short amount of time. But with respect to uh, the first working group, the health working group, these are some of the issues they looked at. Um, youth sports, uh, access to youth sports, heat, chemicals. You know, this is a snapshot of what one group did, but ultimately uh, there was broad consensus on what the research showed. Sometimes there was difference on the margins of, where, of how we interpreted it. But even though we came at this issue from different places, the committee generally uh, read the research and followed the science. So for example, Everyone in the committee, regardless of where they were on artificial turf, realized that certainly artificial turf has higher uh, surface temperatures and wet bulb temperatures. Um, we all acknowledge that. Um, so just reaching consensus on some of the science was really important. We also recognize that artificial turf is made with a series of chemicals. Some of them are hazardous. Uh, what we had to take the deep dive into was um, you know, the chemical, uh, can contain the variety of hazardous chemicals that are included there, which can be potentially inhaled, ingested, or contacted dermally. You know, what are the effects? How much exposure results from playing an artificial turf with those chemicals? And this is where we, we crunched the studies, we looked at the chemicals, we did the research. Next slide, please. Safety, these were the topics we looked at. Injury rates, heat-related injuries, skin bacteria issues. Interestingly, on these sets of issues, it was very eye-opening. Turns out the studies show that there's practically no difference uh, on sports injuries between artificial turf and natural turf. If anything, artificial turf in some respects was better for concussions. Natural turf was better for uh, ankle injuries and, um, and knee injuries. So in the end, sort of on sports injury issues, it was something of a wash. Next slide, please. The environmental group took a very deep dive, and kudos to them for taking on a lot, but they looked at a series of issues. Uh, particularly runoff, stormwater, permeability as they relate to the chemicals and materials that are in artificial turf. While natural grass fields act as a natural filter for chemical and particulate pollution, artificial turf fields don't, and so mass, that's why MassDEP is currently considering officially classifying artificial turf as an impermeable surface under the Wetlands Protection Act. The group also looked at the carbon footprint of artificial turf, the production, installation, disposal processes. They looked at issues related to infills, and actually that was particularly interesting. I wish I had more time to get into it. But what are the alternatives to crumb rubber tire, which is one of the more controversial pieces of artificial turf? I think there was widespread consensus that crumb rubber tire is not a good infill, generally speaking, and that in the future we should move away from it. However, we looked at the alternatives to crumb rubber tire right now and found that many of them are very untested. Uh, ultimately, the studies are quite in their infancy. They're promising, but they're not quite there yet. Things like Brock fill or green sand. Um, next slide, please. The committee also took a look at something that was technically outside their charge, but the committee felt was very important to really truly understand this issue, the idea of maintenance and costs. Um, we collected data from various sources about what the costs of installing, maintaining, and end of life care for artificial turf and natural grass. You can see generally, they're ne never too far apart, although artificial turf is always sort of suffering a little bit for the end of life piece because it has to be replaced every seven to 10 years usually. If it's maintained well, it's more at the 10 year range. If it's not, it's usually more at the six or seven year range. Um, one thing we did really emphasize though was good maintenance leads to good fields. You can get more out of a field if it's maintained well. Um, next slide. Now to the committee's consensus findings in the final four minutes I have. So no one on the committee supported a moratorium or a ban on the construction of artificial turf fields in Arlington at this time. But members did express certain concerns about artificial turf, particularly related to the materials used in its production, the possible chemical pollution to aquatic ecosystems from runoff, particulate and plastic pollution, increased heat, lack of carbon sequestration, use of fossil fuels in, in, the, in its production, subsequent environmental impact due to the need for replacement every seven to 10 years, and inconsistent recycling at end of life. Next slide, please. 
Committee members also recognize the merits, however, or benefits of artificial turf playing fields, first and foremost being their accessibility and durability, even in harsh New England weather. Artificial turf allows greater use, particularly for young people, in the shoulder seasons of early spring and late fall, and notably many of the health and environmental shortcomings of artificial turf we found can be either partially or fully, in some cases, mitigated. Next slide, please. With respect to the recommendations of the committee, the committee believes that artificial turf should be an option, an option for future field planners in Arlington after careful evaluation of the practicality and feasibility of natural turf options. In evaluating artificial turf, the committee believes the following points should be considered. Next slide, please. Crumb rubber infill should not be used in future artificial turf projects in Arlington, those not currently in the planning stages. Any artificial turf installed in an Arlington field should be certified by an independent lab, not just the manufacturer, as being free of PFAS and other toxic chemicals before shipment. Any artificial turf field, and natural turf field for that matter, should be held to strict heat standards on the hottest days of the year, including temperature monitoring. Any decision about where to place an artificial turf field should consider if placement of that field is in or near a designated heat island in Arlington. Next slide, please. When Arlington considers renovations of its field, it should also examine equitable access to high quality playing surfaces and balance the needs of different neighborhoods in that planning process. There should be no, and finally the last recommendation we made, there should be no purchase of an artificial turf field until the town contractually mandates that the manufacturer will take full responsibility in the most environmentally sensitive manner possible at the end of the product's life. We've seen some towns actually do this. It can be done. Next slide, please. Furthermore, all of Arlington fields, artificial and natural turf alike, require high quality maintenance programs, and the committee really wanted to emphasize this. No future field should be developed or redeveloped without those costs fully factored into the financial analysis at the beginning of the project. Arlington must maintain its fields to a higher standard, including proper, including proper resting of its fields. Next slide, please. In the final analysis, the committee believes that artificial turf fields can be an option for Arlington's future field projects. If A, after careful evaluation of the practicality and feasibility of natural turf options, and B, with proper health and environmental safeguards in place. Next slide, please. To appreciate the extensive work of the committee, I recommend that you read the full report, available at the links on the screen. And I wanna just do a huge shout out to the committee members who moved heaven and earth in a very short span of time. There were school vacations in the middle of this, there were holidays. I wanna also give a shout out to the committed citizens who came to every meeting. You know who you are. Susan Stamps, Jean Benson, who submitted this article in the first place, just to name two. Um, we appreciated the, the research that was shared with us, the commitment to see this project through to the end. I think ultimately, even though people came to this committee from different viewpoints, we somehow got to yes with a series of recommendations that I think we could all believe in that, and that will ultimately be good for the town and its planners. I think this was one of the most successful town committees I've ever served on. And let me tell you, when this article passed last year, I remember turning to my seatmate and saying, I have no idea how the town is ever gonna find anyone to serve on this committee. Well, we, we, life is funny, we hit the jackpot. I really am proud of this report, so thank you very much. Okay, do we have any other reports of committees? Uh, uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. I move receipt of the update to the Select Board report for Articles 8 and 9. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of receiving a supplemental Select Board report say yes. Or say yay. Yay. Let's try that again. All those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. It is accepted unanimously. Just want to briefly provide town meetings with meeting members with a further update. On, on the first night of town meeting, I reported that we had reconsidered our votes on articles eight and nine. Article eight was originally a will report. That is now a no action vote. 
Article 9 was a no action vote. Now it is a favorable action vote. And the reason we did that is we received a recommendation from the town meeting uh, procedures committee uh, stating a preference that uh, really for efficiency purposes for town meeting that a vote on the start time for town meeting is conducted easier through Article 9 than it is 8. There was also a preference not to put an end time of 1030. That was contained in the Article 8 uh, Warren article. So for that reason, uh, we, we changed our votes. I spoke to the proponents of both Articles 8 and 9, Mr. Goff and Ms. Kelleher, prior to updating this report. They're aware of this and they will be presenting together on Article 9. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Any other reports of committees? Uh, Ms. Deschel? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move receipt of the Finance Committee's supplemental report to tell me. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor say yay for the Finance Committee supplemental report. Yay. All those opposed say nay. It is unanimous. In our original report, we said that we would report at town meeting on Article 64 and 65, and that is what we are doing with the supplemental report. You will also notice that just for record keeping, we've also um, put in writing what our um, administrative correction to 61 and 63 were, and those votes have already been taken. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports of committees? Yeah, Mr. Loretti? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I don't have a report myself. I do have a question about the Select Board Supplemental Report. I didn't see it on the back table. Does town meeting have that in writing anywhere? Do we have printed copies? No. We do not. We can, we can display it, and we were receiving that, I believe, orally. Is it, is it on the um, online, on the um, annotated? It is board? not. Okay. Thank you. Any other reports of committee? Oh, do you want to respond? Sure, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Monitor. Just want to respond to Mr. Loretti's question. Uh, we had come before town meeting on the first night because it was only one line that was presented. I presented the update orally on April 24th. The written report tonight is really to establish a record for the clerk, but uh, we had uh, informed the meeting the moderator had informed the meeting on Friday as to what would happen this evening, too, in terms of changing the uh, order on Articles 8 and 9. Thank you. And just to, to clarify, uh, since uh, this is not usual, um, uh, the, the recommended vote now for Article 8 is no action. The recommended vote of the select board of Article 9 is favorable action which is to change, it's literally the, it's the last sentence of the first paragraph of the town bylaws in Title I, Article I, Section 1. Um, yeah, if we can just display that text in context. It's listed under Article 9. So yeah, let's make sure everyone's on the same page about this, um, especially since, as Mr. Loretti pointed out, we don't have paper copies of this, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. Oh, there, there's in, in your in the presentation spreadsheet. There's a report listed for Article Nine, and then we can see the change in context. Uh, it's called Select Board Recommended Vote in the spreadsheet. This is the, uh, the FinCom supplemental report. Um, it's, uh, yeah. That's it, yeah. Yep. Guys, remember, so Article 8 is, had, now has a recommended vote of no action. Article 9, um, if you scroll to the end, yeah, go all the way, to, yeah, here. So th this is literally the first paragraph of the town bylaws. Um, 
and you could see the last sentence in that paragraph. The, the words eight o'clock are stricken and replaced with the words 7.30, which is referring to 8 p.m. for the, the start time for the first night of annual town meeting on the, first, uh, the, the fourth Monday of April, changing the eight o'clock to 7.30 in the evening. And that's the, the select board's updated recommended vote on Article 9. Uh, Article 10 has the same recommended vote that you've seen in the select board, the original select board report from weeks ago. So hopefully that clarifies. Okay, so any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Ms. Ms. Deschler. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a second to lay Article 3 on the table. All those in favor say yay. All those opposed say nay. Article three is back on the table. I move that article 17 be taken from the table. Okay, we have a, a, motion, a second on the motion to remove article 17 from the table. Uh, actually, before I take that, did I, did I call for announcements and resolutions? I might have skipped that accidentally. So let me do that now before we, uh, well, let, let, before we take uh, article 17 off the table. Apologies for that. Um, uh, any announcements or resolutions tonight? Okay, seeing none, um, we're back to, we, we have a, a motion to uh, remove Article 17 from the table with a second. All those in favor say yay. yay. All those opposed say nay. Article 17 is now off the table. Uh, let's see, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, did you want to introduce this? And then Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board uh, moved no action on, it was recommending no action on this Warren article by a five to zero vote. We had a hearing on this on March 26, probably one of our longer hearings for the uh, regular town meeting. And um, we had several concerns with this. As, as presented to us, there were a number of statutory conflicts. This, this proposal would, have, would be the first of its kind on the municipal level um, to, to um, dealing with pet restrictions. And during the course of the hearing, it became very clear that there was a conflict with condominium law, chapter 183A. There was a clear conflict with the security deposit law, which is chapter 186, potential conflicts with insurance law. And there was also conflicts uh, per town council, and he'll get into that in a little while, on the uh, Fair Housing Act and the Mass Anti-Discrimination Statute, which is Chapter 151B. For all of those reasons, and I'm going to get into several more, we felt that a municipal bylaw isn't the appropriate place to deal with restrictions on pets. And... Um, the scope of the problem as presented to us by the proponents is that they were basing the proposed bylaw on larger or more commercial operations and exempting very small properties. And during the course of the hearing, Mr. Diggins asked, is, has, why hasn't the market solved this problem? And um, one of the things that came out of that hearing or didn't come out of that hearing is we really didn't receive any statistics in terms of what's going on in Arlington, particularly for the larger properties. And, and I will note for Tom Meeting's benefit, the five largest apartment properties in Arlington by assessed value, if you go on the assessor's website, land use code 112, which is apartment buildings eight units or over, the top five uh, apartments in town, Arlington 360 up at Sims, Brigham Square, the Legacy in Arlington Center, 17 Mill Street, and the brand new apartment that is to be open at 1165 Mass Ave. Every single one of them allow pets, um, up to two pets in most instances, but based on their particular situation. So it left us wondering after the fact, okay, what are, what are we trying to deal with? with here specifically, and we would have liked to perhaps some more information on that. We were told that the proposed bylaw was modeled on two sources, current law in California, and there are two statutes in California, one that requires pets for properties that receive state financing, and it's a condition of receiving the financing. The other is a bill known as AB 2216, which is still pending, and I know it's a state law, um, 
and that is working its way through the California legislature. Uh, since our hearing, I believe it received a, a favorable report out of committee. But again, that deals with several different statutes that we just can't deal with through a bylaw here. And w we were told that the proposed bylaw was virtually identical to AB 2216, and, and uh, in looking at it, I, it, it really isn't. There's a lot of differences, differences in terms of exceptions, differences in terms of causes of action. And so at the end of the day, we're very concerned about our ability to issue a bylaw that is in conflict with state law. We're also concerned about freedom of contract particularly in the condominium setting. Uh, Mr. Tosti appeared before us and talked about issues that he has with his condominium association. Uh, his condominium does not allow pets and that's by through the bylaws as, as approved by the, the trustees of, of, of that condominium. So that was a further reason that, that caused us not to um, support this. Finally, we were very concerned about what the town's ability would be to enforce this bylaw and what resources would be required and um, what staffing would be required. So for all of those reasons, uh, we voted no action. I understand there's a substitute motion. There are remaining concerns. I, I encourage town meeting members to ask questions, ask for differences, ask why state law versus municipal law. We're happy to answer them. Um, I will say we are sympathetic to the situation uh, for pet owners. I thought it was an excellent discussion that evening. We've had further dialogue since then. We just have a disagreement whether this is the forum to, uh, to deal with this issue. So I'd like now to turn it over to Attorney Cunningham to talk about some of the issues regarding protected classes and discrimination. And uh, Town Manager Feeney would also like to update the, the, uh, the body regarding potential enforcement issues. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Corsi, uh, Michael Cunningham, Town Council. And first, I want to thank the proponents, Mr. Schlickman and his uh, attorneys and the other proponents who worked on this and thank them for their thoughtful discussions. However, I do have uh, some concerns regarding the viability of this potential bylaw. Chief among them is the fact that there are fair housing law and fair housing acts that have been promulgated by the federal government, the state government that, in my opinion, occupy the field on this particular topic. From a legal perspective, um, occupying the field occurs when the legislature intends to preempt the field on a topic. A municipal bylaw on that topic is invalid and must be disapproved. The specific instance of test we would apply to this particular bylaw would be legislation on a subject is so comprehensive that an inference would be justified that the legislature intended, intended to preempt the field. I note that under state law that's been in existence since 1946, discrimination in housing is prohibited based upon many factors, protected classes, including race, religious creed, color, national origin, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, genetic information, ancestry, marital status, status of a veteran or member of the armed services, and source of income. This type of comprehensive list indicates to me that this, in, the legislature intends to occupy the field, therefore uh, the town's attempt to enact this bylaw is impermissible. Uh, I note that Chapter 151 that was enacted in 1946 has been amended 64 times. I would suggest that this type of bylaw or this type of change to the, to the statute is best approached at the state level. Thank you. And Mr. Feeney and 11 seconds, do you want to say something quick? I'll just say I appreciate the proponent, Jim Feeney, town manager, appreciate the proponents for advancing uh, the May 3rd Tanaka amendment that addressed uh, sort of pigeonholing enforcement under inspectional services and providing for some future uh, flexibility, but there is a concern that this may result in uh, a significant number of violations to be addressed in the future, and I would think that either uh, the Finance Committee and ultimately this body may need to uh, consider a future request for additional resources to address this bylaw if that did tra ultimately transpire. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we, uh, so Mr. Schlickman is both the petitioner and the main proponent. Uh, before we take Mr. Schlickman, uh, let's switch over to the speaker queue uh, so we can reset that. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to reset the speaker queue here. And once it's clear, you can press the button to request to speak. And I will take Mr. Radokia and Ms. Garber uh, following Mr. Schlickman's presentation. Oh, and also there's additional amendments. Um, Mr. Schlickman? And we have a presentation. Okay, let's get the presentation up. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, I move the substitute motion under Article 17. Okay, uh, Mr. Slickman's substitute motion is now pending in front of us. Next slide. Let's address the elephant in the room. Next slide. At our warrant article hearing before the select board, we presented a proposal that was modeled on regulations for federally funded housing and current legislation in California. Since then, we have worked to address many of the initial concerns. Deschert LLP, an international law firm, issued an opinion on behalf of the MSPCA stating that the version presented tonight stands on solid legal ground. Their opinion is in your annotated warrant. Next slide. We have worked with attorneys from the Animal Rescue League, the MSPCA, the Animal Legal Defense Fund to craft the vote before you tonight. These organizations ask for your positive vote on Article 17. Next slide. When town meeting is a court of opinion, not a court of law, the final decision on the legality of any town bylaw rests with the Attorney General's office. Because there are 292 towns in the Commonwealth, they only issue opinions on bylaws adopted by a town meeting. So I ask everyone to put aside any legal questions and vote your hopes and dreams as the Attorney General will conduct a binding legal review. Next slide. The goal of Article 17 is to promote a reasonable pet policy. Reasonable lives somewhere between a blanket pet ban and 17 cats in a 500 square foot studio apartment. Last fall, we recognized our place in the regional housing crisis and blanket pet bans make the problem even worse. Next slide. There's an increased number in the number of cats and dogs that were euthanized or died in Massachusetts shelters. According to the National Council of Pet Population Study and Policy, Moving is the most cited reason people give for surrendering their animals to shelters with landlord issues close behind. Massachusetts shelters similarly find these reasons just as prevalent. Next slide. One side effect of the tight real estate market is the difficulty families encounter when seeking housing. Make no mistake about it, animal companions are part of our families. My niece included her dog in her wedding picture. Next slide. After we presented the first version of a bylaw to the select board, we listened. Based on feedback, we made several changes to the proposed bylaw. Next slide. We don't want to force someone to give up a beloved animal companion, but we don't want to force a property owner to live with an animal. We exempt owner-occupied two and three family homes. Next slide. Town Council made a persuasive argument that Massachusetts municipalities cannot regulate condominium bylaws. So we exempted condominium associations. Next slide. We exempt the rental of rooms within a housing unit, and we exempt accessory dwelling units. Next slide. We exempt furnished departments. Sometimes cats value furniture differently than their human counterparts. Next slide. Property owners can require animals to be vaccinated, sterilized, and appropriately licensed. Animals must be cared for in compliance with health, animal control, and anti-cruelty laws. Next slide. Property owners can enforce reasonable rules relating to the quiet enjoyment of other tenants, such as noise, sanitation, and safety. Next slide. 
Property owners can enforce reasonable rules related to the number and size of companion animals based on the size of the dwelling unit. When we wrote this bylaw, we viewed the Housing Corporation of Arlington as having reasonable rules. They were worried that someone could argue against the reasonable, so the doctoral amendment uses the HCA as a benchmark for reasonableness. In response, HCA submitted this statement to town meeting, quote, the Housing Corporation understands that a motion to amend Warrant Article 17 has recently been submitted to town meeting by Sue Doctorow. This amendment addresses our concerns regarding the bylaw established under Article 17 and provides confidence that we can continue to rely on our long-standing pet policy. Next slide. Property owners can regulate the occupant of the housing unit or can require to maintain liability or renter's insurance covering injury to persons or property. Next slide. A property owner may petition the Board of Health to grant an exemption from this bylaw if a legitimate, significant, and unfavorable hardship exists that will harm the property owner or a tenant's health and well-being. Next slide. Our bylaws set the, the police as the default enforcement agency of all bylaws with a $20 fine. We didn't want people calling Officer Hogan to mediate pet disputes, so we placed the bylaw under the building inspector. Last week, the town manager asked us to amend the enforcement provision, making him responsible for enforcement. The Tanaka Amendment will achieve that goal. Next slide. This will be the first bylaw of its kind in Massachusetts. We don't know how the Attorney General will respond. The Attorney General may ask us to make some adjustments. It's likely we will work with the town to further define enforcement. We want to give property owners adequate notice before the law takes effect. That is why we postpone enactment until July 1st, 2026. Next slide. Please support the amendments and the substitute motion under Article 17. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slickman. Okay. Uh, we have two amendments, uh, and we'll start with um, uh, the doctoral amendment, uh, Ms. Doctor. And just to be clear, licensing does not include operation of motor vehicles. Hear me? Sue Doctorow, Precinct 21. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move my amendment to the substitute motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Uh, it is now pending before us. I'd also like to introduce Christine Dorchak, who's an Arlington resident. Okay, she's an Arlington resident. She has the right to speak. Thank you. Um, as Paul mentioned, the, the am amendment simply adds wording to address concerns that the Housing Corporation of Arlington expressed about Article 17. The amendment recognizes that the HCA already has a long-standing successful policy allowing ho household pets with reasonable rules to ensure that all its tenants enjoy safe, decent, and affordable housing. The amendment also emphasizes that the intent of Article 17 is to replace blanket pet bans with similar well-balanced policies respectful of pet owners, other tenants, neighbors, and property owners. HCA has demonstrated that this is possible. In addition, the Arlington Housing Authority has demonstrated that it's possible. Um, I appreciate the new statement by the HCA indicating that this amendment eliminates its concerns about Article 17. And now I'd like to turn my time to Christine Dorschach. Good evening, my name is Christine Ayn Dorchak and I live in Precinct 8. I'd like to ask for your thoughtful consideration and vote in support of Article 17 tonight. I'm an animal protection attorney and one of the founders of Greyhound Protection Group, Grey 2K USA Worldwide. We're actually located right across the street. I'm honored to be before you tonight as one of the chief drafters of the Article 17 substitute. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the process that we followed and the good public policy that's behind Article 17. Since its initial presentation before the select board, Article 17 has been carefully redrafted by myself and two expert lawyers with the MSPCA. 
we took input from stakeholders, including property owners, members of uh, housing uh, authority. We, we met with town council. We did our due diligence so much that we obtained the guidance of outside counsel with the Deckert Law Firm, who are experts in the area of housing. We ensured compliance with state and federal law. The result was the inclusion of various exemptions as well as a two-year phase-in period. The goal of Article 17 is to facilitate the positive benefit of companion animals in Arlington while balancing the rights of property owners in our community. The measure creates enforceable standards and establishes the duties of conduct for renters and also allows property owners to seek exemptions when appropriate. You know, years ago, when my parents brought me home from the hospital, they were greeted with an eviction notice. It was completely permissible for a landlord to say, no babies here. That was obviously against public policy and that is no longer happening. It was against public policy because we wanna support a happy and healthy family life. In the same way, Article 17 looks to enhance family life and aligns with good public policy. Now, while we appreciate that there are some rental of units available that allow companion animals already, and we certainly applaud the Housing Corporation of Arlington and the Arlington Housing Authority for those policies. We would like to see a town-wide policy. We're looking to provide confidence and security, certainty, so that everyone knows the rules and the rules are enforceable. That said, the exemptions we have included in the substitute are numerous. Principally, condominiums and condominium associations, furnished units, as well as owner-occupied dwellings do not fall within the purview of the proposal. And perhaps most importantly, the substitute allows any property owner to seek a grant of exemption from the Board of Health. In other words, there is a general fail-safe built right into the bylaw. Also significantly, and something that surpasses some of the current animal authorizations in place, the Article 17 substitute allows property owners to require that companion animals be sterilized and vaccinated, for tenants to obtain insurance and pay a security deposit, and for the property owner to enforce reasonable rules at all times to protect the quiet enjoyment of all tenants. These reasonable and fair rules include size and number restrictions on companion animals as appropriate. All of this is with the goal of achieving a balanced approach to helping save companion animals who would otherwise be killed with the rights of property owners and other tenants so they can all have a peaceful, friendly environment. On a personal note, I came to live here in Arlington because a friend of mine owned an apartment building and he welcomed me my husband, and my cats. I had left Boston after 20 years when the apartment I rented changed its rules with, about allowing companion animals. And now I find myself in the same position as my landlord is, is no longer, my friend is no longer my landlord. My building has been sold. So I'm in limbo. I don't know if I can have companion animals or not. So in this way, the Article 17 substitute is not only designed for people who want to have a dog, cat, or other companion animal in the future, it's also for those who have them now and could be told to leave at any time. Article 17 sets a clear framework that provides the security that people like me, people who follow the rules, deserve to have. I hope you will support Article 17 tonight. And, and we move the motion, I believe, right? Okay, so we have an amendment that's pending on the substitute motion. Uh, and finally, we have uh, uh, Ms. Tanaka. Rieko Tanaka, Precinct 9. I move the Tanaka amendment to the substitute motion under Article 17. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Your amendment is now pending on the substitute motion. Go ahead. I'd like to introduce Laura Kiesel, a resident of Everett Street, who has asked to address town meeting, and she would like to speak from the satellite room. Okay. Hello, I am Laura Kiesel from Precinct 7. I just want to say a few words tonight. Um, first, I want to mention that almost all of the animal rescues that endorsed 
Article 16 also endorsed this warrant and wrote letters or words of support to the select board, noting that they are getting inundated by animal surrenders, primarily fueled by the lack of pet-friendly housing, and that when they cannot take these animals in, very often they are tragically put to sleep. And this is a crisis that has gotten much worse since the COVID pandemic. This is something I've dealt with firsthand. For years, I've been volunteering, networking to secure adopters and fosters for cats and dogs posted on the weekly kill list for the animal control centers in my native New York City. Every seven to eight out of 10 of those animals wind up there due to housing issues. And while there are some successes in finding placements, most often these animals are euthanized. Thousands of companion animals are killed every year in our state and region due to the lack of ability to find pet-friendly housing. This is a challenge I have experienced directly. In 2011, my name finally came up on the wait list for the Housing Corporation of Arlington, but I was told I would have to give up my two cats if I wanted the unit, as at the time, HCA had a no pets policy. Three of my immediate family members had just passed away. The thought of parting with more of my family was intolerable to me at this time, and so I forfeited the unit. But I struggled to find an apartment on the private market in my budget that allowed animals, and I almost became homeless. I spent time planning how my cats and I would live out of my station wagon. Fortunately, I found a place at the 11th hour, and a couple of years later, HCA offered me another unit, this time that would allow me to have my cats. However, in 2021, my disability had progressed to the point where I could no longer live up four flights of stairs, so I searched for a more accessible unit on the private market. I thought I would have an easier time this time around, as I had long had a, doc a letter from my doctor saying that my cats served as emotional support animals, which are exempt from no pet policies under state and federal fair housing law. Nonetheless, I was repeatedly illegally denied housing by landlords and brokers once I mentioned I had ESAs, with them always citing these no pet policies. I regularly witnessed this denial of other people with assistance animals as well, including their service dogs. I eventually gave up looking at units with no pet policies, which severely limited the housing stock available to me, delayed my move by months, and worsened my health condition. This is why it is especially concerning to hear some town meeting members say that they want these no pet policies to remain, to keep what they call animal free dwellings, um, or to keep anim, uh, dwellings free from pet dander, which according to the National Institutes of Health is not possible to achieve through these policies. Comments to keep dwellings completely animal free are discriminatory as the only way to guarantee that is to deny di disabled people our assistance animals. Assistance animals make up a third of companion animals owned in this country. We are not a fringe demographic. Additionally, prospective tenants coming in with severe animal allergies are entitled under fair housing to re request from landlords that they clean up the unit prior to move in, which the NIH notes is the most appropriate and effective way to address animal allergies. Surveys show that 70% of households in the US have animals. Of those, the Pew Research has found in a widespread nationwide survey that 97% of people consider those animals, quote, critical members of our family, end quote. That our animals are our family is not a radical concept in our country, but rather a universal conviction. But blanket no pet policy set up a dangerous double standards that mandate that simply because renters, who make up about 44% of Arlington's population, do not have the economic or generational privilege to loan, own land and property, that we do not deserve our animals, and that we can be compelled to discard them, our family, knowing that it is possible, if not actually probable, that they can be killed as a result. If we refuse that option, we can then in turn be deprived of one of the most basic human necessities, shelter. This is why 60% or more of domestic violence victims remain with their abuser indefinitely, because they cannot secure housing that will allow them to bring their animals with them. Renters add value to this town, and in turn, we hope that we are genuinely valued by our community and that that will be reflected in these revised policies. Studies consistently show that renters with animals make more responsible and stable tenants and that there are no discernible differences in damages incurred where pets are present. And yet we are judged by misconceptions usually rooted in class-based or racialized stereotypes. 
the work that I do through Save Arlington Wildlife, I can only continue to do here in this community if I can maintain housing that allows me my animals. I can only remain functional as a disabled person if I can have my assistance animals in my life. And so I would like to urge people to think about these situations tonight and who is vulnerable to these because we talk a lot about laws and, and we don't want these legal, to deal with all this legal red tape, but vulnerable people like me who are being illegally leg, leg, denied housing, we don't really have any recourse. So these burdens are externalized on us. So I urge you to think about this and vote for support tonight for Article 17 and its substitute amendments. Thank you. Okay, before we take our next speakers from the queue, um, I have to point out that uh, this was not an even-handed uh, presentation of the opening of, of this article. The expectation, my expectation, is that when proponents are introducing, or movements technically are introducing uh, their motions, that they're focused primarily, and maybe I haven't been clear about, uh, about this, and I apologize if I haven't, that anyone who's moving their motion should be primarily focused in their presentation on the motion that they're offering. The speakers, that we, the last two speaking slots that we heard for the two amendments to the substitute motion were speaking largely to the merits of the Schlickman substitute motion, not the amendments to that substitute motion. I didn't hear much uh, in those last two speaking slots about uh, the specifics of the Doctro Amendment or the Tanaka Amendment. So let's please keep that in mind going forward. Uh, uh, after we hear from Mr. Radokia and Ms. Garber, uh, I, uh, I may have to ask for folks on the other side of this debate because to be fair, Mr. DeCourcy, uh, Mr. Cunningham, and Mr. Feeney had to squeeze all their commentary into one seven minute speaking slot. Mr. Cunningham, did you have something to say? A legal question that was raised? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Just for clarity, discrimination against persons with assistance animals is already protected by law. That would be an illegal practice. They'd be subject to remedies through the judicial process. Thank you for that clarification. So we'll now go to the speaker queue. And um, I, may need, I may need to exercise discretion to balance things out because I found that particularly unbalanced and outside of my expectation for the introduction of amendments. Uh, so we'll start with Mr. Radokia and then Ms. Garber. Um, Bob, this is uh, Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. Um, first of all, I want to state that there was no federal funding involved in the acquisition of the two-family house I own. Um, so I, I'm not sure how much of that will apply to me or not, but anyhow, um, I resent the fact that I'm being forced to perhaps do things that I'm not in favor of. This afternoon, I was talking to my, an insurance company, an application for uh, insurance policy at the address. And one of the questions they had was, are there any dogs there now? And I said, no. And then I asked, what does that have to do with it? And the answer was, well, you know, you should have some liability insurance, regardless of what people say, tell you. Um, you should increase your liability insurance because even though it might be indicated that nothing will happen, a good lawyer will find a way to make it happen. So you need to protect yourself that way. So I'm being asked to do that. Um, allergies, yesterday I had 20 people over to my house for Mother's Day and several other things. And a couple of the people couldn't really come into the house because they have a golden retriever. And so they actually ended up sitting out on the deck having their meal and things like that. And in a case like a two-family house, that's much like a single in a lot of ways because the tenants are in the same place, they share the same car, everything. And to have a pet that's creating a problem for someone else, um, how do I have to deal with that? Can I say to them, well, you can't come here because this person has an allergy and you bring in a dog, you got a problem. 
So, you know, that, that's, that's not working out well for me. So, um, between the insurance, this, that, and the other thing, I, I'm totally against this, and it's like infringing on my rights to own a property, because, um, like I said, no federal funding involved. I did it on my own, and I don't expect anybody to share my cost with me, And but that's the way it's going to be if I, we go through with it. So I'm voting no against all of it, and I uh, hope you might open your eyes to it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take Ms. Garber next, and then Mr. Benson. Judith Garber, Precinct 4. Uh, I am very much in support of this uh, substitute motion. I've heard a little bit about uh, people asking, how does this even apply to when so many places offer animals? I just want to offer my own personal story. This, I really wish this bylaw had been passed several years ago. Uh, I was living in an apartment with my husband, and we were when COVID hit, we were really hoping to adopt a cat, rescue a cat. But um, even though we've been living there for a while, the landlord's property manager, through their property manager, they had a no pet policy. And um, it didn't seem like we were asking for much, you know, Cativa's company in this lockdown where it was like, you know, very emotionally trying for everyone. And it didn't matter, property manager said no. And this would be an exact example of what this um, amendment would help with as is not an owner occupied two family or three family unit. Uh, but to me, it just feels like a really important issue of fairness, like it's very difficult to own a home in Arlington. It's very expensive and there's, the market is really crammed. It's really hard to own a house. So if you don't own a house, like you don't get that fundamental, it's not, not a protected right, right? But it's a, it, it's a need, it's a, to have a, a companion, which is what, what this is all about. But I've also talked to other people in Arlington about this. It's not just about me and my family, right? Um, I do have a friend who this a very similar uh, situation applies to. Uh, they were with a, their long-term partner and they co-owned a dog. And then when they split up, he basically had to relinquish custody of the dog because the apartment he found in Arlington had a no pet policy. Um, however, I also have a friend who owns a two-family house, has a fear of dogs. I'm relieved that this uh, substitute motion, this wouldn't apply because owner occupied two-family house. Similarly, uh, a friend I know I talked to about this was concerned about what if there's noise issues or, you know, danger issues, and I'm encouraged to see that in this uh, motion there's uh, exceptions for, for all that as well. And I want just to conclude by uh, reading from um, my colleague Lynette Culverhouse in Precinct 11. She, she, write, she writes, Arlington has always prided itself on being a welcoming town. I would like to think that we welcome our low-income renters in the same way we welcome our more privileged neighbors who own their homes. To deny renters the same right as homeowners to have a pet is just another way to discriminate against people with low-paying jobs, often women, single mothers, and people in the service industry. Allowing renters to keep their beloved pets, who are often for emotional support, is one step toward affirming the welcome that I believe Arlington wants to extend to all its residents. It is cruel to ask renters to have to choose between housing and keeping their pet. This is not who I think we are, so I hope you will join me in supporting this article. And I echo those words as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Benson, and then Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eugene Benson, Precinct 10. As a former pet owner, and a legal service at attorney in my past who represented tenants. I am very sympathetic to goals of this warrant article, but I cannot support it as presented. I think the concept of requiring some landlords to allow some pets is a good concept, but I think the article is written and presented is unacceptable. Our job as town meeting members is not only to agree on a policy, but also to determine if the substitute motion in this case is good enough to become the law of the town. I think it is not in this instance for the reasons I will give you. I see the substitute motion as a first draft that needs a lot of work. I would really like it to come back next year in a much tighter proposal that resolves at least some of the issues that have been raised about the main motion. I'm just going to go through a few of the many problems I have with this as presented. Number one, the definition of companion animal. It's any animal that resides 
and sleeps in, indoors, so no longer is having it is legal. Here's a list of all the legal animals in Massachusetts. You can't see it. It's over 200, pay, over 200 animals long. A few of them you would not have in your house, but most of them you would, including, among other things, uh, 21 types of snakes, including all species of boas and pythons. So I have a little bit of concern that the list of companion animals that this would allow is much broader than any of us could possibly imagine or would want in any of these places. Um, it allows two cats but only one dog. Why only, why two cats and only one dog? A lot of people in my neighborhood have two dogs. I've seen people with two Shelties, people with two Scotties, people with two mixed breeds dogs. It makes no sense to allow two cats and one dog. It also actually says at least one dog or two cats. What's that mean? You can't have one dog and one cat. I used to pet sit for people who had one dog and one cat. So many things wrong with this as written. An exception if it would harm the health or well-being of the owner or another tenant. How would the landlord know about all the other tenants? One of my nephews was deathly afraid of dogs as a kid and would have been freaked out if a large dog had moved in next door. The landlord would not necessarily have known about that. Um, what about if a single family homeowner is on a year sabbatical, wants to rent out their house for a year, then coming back? They would have to rent it out to people with pets, even if they didn't want to do that, even if they had pets that would be coming back that would not be happy when they sniffed around and saw who was in the house for the past year. This doesn't have enough exceptions. Um, there's nothing in the article that talks about the remedy for a landlord if the tenant does not meet the requirements of the law. It seems to place all the enforcement on someone in town, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, under state law, the landlord cannot collect more than the standard security deposit. They cannot collect an extra security deposit for having a pet. This does mention the landlord can select a security deposit, but it doesn't mean anything since it can't collect more. Landlords can charge more for rent for people with pets, but it's unclear whether they could do this under this law or not because it could be seen as limiting the ability to have a pet, another problem. Also, there's this weird rule in here about landlords not being able to discuss the terms of the lease and the pet requirements until after they've agreed on the terms of the lease, which doesn't make any sense because the landlord would, would not know what it's getting into. Tenant might know if there's not know if there's an upcharge for a security deposit, uh, for rent, anything like that. Big problem there. It also says that the town, it also says that the landlord is protected from liability. For example, if someone's large dog, not known to be dangerous, bites another tenant or child or another tenant's pet, or does damage to someone else's property. I want to ask town council, does the town have the right to limit a landlord's liability? Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town council, no, it does not. Thank you. Also, enforcement, the main motion makes um, Inspectional Services, the enforcer, I spoke with the head of Inspectional Services about this. He said he did not have the staff and resources to do the enforcement. If it's switched to the town council, I can't see Mr. Feeney going out um, from place to place and doing this. So he's going to have to assign it to someone. Guess who that might be? Inspectional Services. Or maybe he'd assign it to the police. Do we really want the police to enforce this? I personally don't think so. I'd be inclined to vote for a proposal that would be limited to four unit and larger buildings so we're not dealing with small property owners and without the issues I noted above. But what I might approve is not what's being presented to town meeting. This is the first of its kind in the state. 
I think we have an obligation to get it right, and this is not getting it right. Even if the Attorney General says this is legal, I have highlighted so many other things that are wrong with this that has nothing to do with legality that I will be voting no, and I would hope that you vote no, and I would hope that Mr. Schlickman comes back with a better proposal next year. Thank you. Actually, before we take Mr. Moore, it is 9.30, so let's, let's take a 10-minute break and come right back. Thank you. Recessed for 10 minutes. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, we're getting started. We start with Mr. Moore and then Mr. Jameson. Okay, order everyone, come on. No, he's not. Uh, sorry. Okay, Mr. Moore, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. Uh, thanks to Mr. Benson for taking away some of the points I needed to bring up. That'll save us some time. Um, in Section 3B, um, there are some various conditions, including Sections 2 and 3, which allow property owners to enforce reasonable rules. Um, if uh, the town is going to enforce this bylaw, somebody's going to have to decide what's reasonable. So, Mr. Mutter, who, who could tell us who's going to make that decision? I'm sorry, what was the question? Who's going <laughs> to... I was updating my pro decide what's tally, reasonable so. when, the, when the bylaw says that property owners can enforce reasonable rules? Who decides what's reasonable? Uh, Mr. Feeney, do you want to take that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Feeney. I think at its core, it's ultimately going to be the function of an attorney to opine on or issue a determination as to whether one of those, one of the rules outlined is reasonable or if it's being reasonably enforced because that determination in what would amount to a quasi-judicial fashion could be subject to challenge by an aggrieved party to determine you know, whether it was arbitrary or capricious or not. So whose attorney is that? Uh, that would be the Office of Town Council. Okay. Um, and if the aggrieved party, either the landlord or the potential tenant, doesn't agree, what happens after that? Uh, that would likely result in litigation. And would the town be a party? Yes. And have you uh, done any looking into what that kind of exposure might cost us? Uh, with respect to cost, I'm not sure I have a specific answer, but again, stressing that this would be a novel bylaw and we would be the first community in Massachusetts, or as far as I know, in any state, uh, that we really don't have a lot of experience to rely on in terms of predicting the number or type of complaints or violations that may need to be addressed, but we have some 20,000 housing units. Uh, I would estimate that at least 6,000 of them are not exempt or otherwise owner-occupied and would be sort of the universe of uh, situations that could arise in complaint or violation. And besides the complaints... You know, uh, uh, just one second. Uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham might have an answer to that as well. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Just quickly, yeah, it would be subject to the Civil Enforcement Statute, chapter, General Law, Chapter 21D, where we would be required to enforce the bylaw. Uh, typically, that process takes uh, quite a bit of time, depending on the court's availability. It's in a district court at the state level, but it could be anywhere from eight months to 10 months, a year even. Thanks. Uh, in addition to the question of what happens when disputes are brought to your attention, how do you imagine uh, the uh, enforcement part of this would affect your staffing? How do you imagine you would, you would actually accomplish it? Well, depending, I, I think, with respect to the May 3rd Tanaka Amendment, I sought that uh, discretion in a, appointing who the enforcement authority would be mm -hmm. because it would depend on the nature of the violation, but also 
because depending on resources, it may require multiple departments depending on the type of complaint or the number of complaints to properly address this. Mm -hmm. And if this turns out to be a significant amount of staff time, what, what do we do about that? Uh, I think the next step, if that did result, would be to approach the Finance Committee and ultimately this body with a request for the appropriate resources. All right, thanks. Um, given that the Housing Corporation of Arlington and the Arlington Housing Authority already have pet permissive policies, and we heard earlier in this meeting that the largest five um, apartment buildings by value also have pet permissive policies, um, it occurred to me that there are a few other things going on here. Um, first of all, there is a population, maybe you haven't heard from it that much yet, who prefer uh, to have pet exclusive housing. People who have medical conditions, people who have allergies, etc. And I think there's a place in the market for both kinds of housing. So I just wanted to see what was going on in town right now. I looked on Zillow, this was cheap and easy, I did it this afternoon, at all the rental apartments, condos, and townhomes that were available listed today at noon on Zillow. There were 84. Now, some of those represent multiple units, but it's, a, it's an approximation. So of those, 48%, half of them, allow cats. 35% small dogs, 25% large dogs. So there's a lot of pet-inclusive housing available in this town. I also looked into maybe trying to understand how much pet-inclusive housing do we really need. Um, the American Veterinary Medical Association survey from 2024 answers that question at least in one way. For the state of Massachusetts, 49% of households have a pet, so about half. 24% have a cat, 29% have a dog. So this seems like a solution looking for a problem that doesn't exist. The market has solved this problem by providing pet inclusive housing and pet exclusive housing. And uh, the people who are renting can find out, find which one they want. And I don't think the argument that low income uh, is a problem works because of the very inclusive policies that are available from HCA and Arlington Housing Authority. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take Mr. Jamison next, and then Mr. Palmer. And we've balanced out the speakers between pro and con. How about that? Mr. Jamison? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. I move to terminate debate on this and all matters before us. Okay, we have a second to uh, terminate debate. Uh, and before I take a vote on termination of debate, uh, I was informed during the break that according to the town bylaws, uh, I checked this to verify, Title I, Article I, Section 10, Item C states, all votes, unless otherwise provided by law, shall be taken in the first instance by a yes and no. And those are in double quotes. <laughs> Voice vote or by an electronic tally at the option of the moderator. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, are we on shaky ground by taking yay, nay votes instead? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Um, likely not, but uh, I am conservative with the law, so I would say we'd stick with the original yes and no's. <laughs> All right, we tried. We're gonna have a long conversation at the Town Meeting Procedures Committee over this. Um, <laughs> all those in favor of terminating debate say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. Debate is terminated. Okay, so. We will first, we have to vote the uh, substitute motion la uh, second to last before the main motion. Um, and we have to do it in the order in which, the reverse order in which they're basically stacked on each other. So we're gonna start with the, the Doctoro Amendment, which um, I will briefly summarize, where the Doctoro Amendment is, uh, uh, would amend the substitute motion to add a paragraph at the end of section one, findings and purposes, citing the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And you can read the details. Uh, in your copies. And so once we bring up a vote on the Doctoro Amendment. Okay, and voting is open. If you're in favor of amending the Slickman substitute motion with the Doctoro Amendment, 
to add that paragraph at the end of section one, press one for yes. If you're opposed to amending the Slickman substitute motion with that paragraph, press two for no, or three to abstain. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, we can show it, voting is closed. Yeah. And, and the motion passes 117 in the affirmative, 61 in the negative, and 10 abstentions. So the Schlickman Amendment is now amended by the Doctorow Amendment by adding that paragraph. Um, okay, let's, let's now move on to the, okay, so this is what was just voted on. And while we're at it, can we switch it? Can we show the Tanaka Amendment, which we're about to vote on, so we can see that in advance? And the Tanaka Amendment, uh, seeks to amend the substitute motion to change the enforcement from the building inspector to the town manager or the town manager's designee. Okay, let's take a vote now on the Tanaka Amendment. Okay, voting is now open. If you're in favor of amending the substitute motion um, by the Tanaka Amendment to change the enforcement from building inspector to the town manager or their designee, press one for yes. Otherwise, uh, press two for no to reject the Tanaka Amendment and three to abstain. Okay, do we have a timer? Let's leave voting open for just a moment longer. Okay, just a few seconds. Let's close voting and the motion passes, 132 in the affirmative, 46 in the negative, and 12 abstentions. So now we have these, the substitute motion that's doubly amended. Both amendments have been applied to the main motion. And these are all majority votes, by the way. Um, and so now we'll take a vote on the substitute motion as amended by both amendments. And so I'm, I'm not gonna read all of the substitute motion. Um, you have that text in front of you. If you're in favor of the substitute motion as amended by both amendments, press one uh, uh, to substitute the, the main motion. Right, so this isn't the last vote. I'm sorry. Yes, th this would substitute and replace the main motion. And we'll have another follow-up vote on the main motion. So this is a vote to whether to substitute the Schlickman Amendment with the two amendments amending it. We have a point of order. Mr. Newton. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Just to be clear, the main motion right now is no action. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. The main motion is still no action. We're voting on uh, whether to substitute the substitute motion in place of the main motion, and then we'll vote on the main motion after that, Thank which you. will either be substituted or not, depending on the outcome of this vote. Yeah. Point of order. Catherine Farrell, Precinct 5. I didn't understand the last vote. I now understand it. I wonder if we could take it again. No. Yes. 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 And so there were questions. I, I, I wasn't expecting that the vote was going to close right there. It, it's, I mean, what can we do? Can, can, we, can we just nullify the vote since there was confusion about whether we were voting on the substitute or the final? Hold on, hold on. We're, we're, just gonna, we're gonna retake this vote with the understanding that this is a vote on whether to substitute the main motion or not. And the substitute includes the two amendments that have been applied to it. This is not the final vote on Article 17. It's about whether to replace the main motion, which is no action currently, whether to replace that with the substitute motion. So if you want to replace the main motion with the amended substitute motion, you'd press one for yes. If you want to leave the main motion as no action, you'd press two for no. Okay, so let's do it again. Voting is open.
and I won't say any more because it'll just confuse people. I think, I think we're all clear on what we're voting on. Okay, five seconds. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion fails, 47 in the affirmative, 140 in the negative, four abstentions. So the, the main motion is not substituted. The main motion remains no action. And now uh, I'll, I'll just take a, a voice vote uh, on the main motion, which is no action, which is essentially inconsequential. Uh, all those in favor of no action say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. We have a no action vote. And so that disposes of Article 17. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that Articles 8, 9, and 10 be taken from the table. Okay, we have a second on a motion to remove Articles 8, 9, and 10 from the table. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. Uh, it, uh, Th those three articles are removed from the table. So that brings uh, Article 8 before us, which, uh, let's see, let me just double check. Uh, this was uh, Mr. Goff's uh, petition, uh, and this has a recommended vote of no action. And so, so we have nothing to debate here, uh, unless uh, Mr. Uh, DeCourcy, did you want to introduce this article, like the, the rationale for no action? And, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Um, as, as stated at the beginning of the meeting, we changed our vote to no action at the recommendation of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee because we will be addressing the start time of Town Meeting through Article 9. Great, thank you. So we don't have a substitute motion in front of us, so we actually don't have any scope for debate since... Uh, Um, Phil Goff, yep. Precinct 7, Mr. Moderator. Yep. Um, I do not have a substitute motion for Article 8, but um, the proponent of Article 9 and I will be speaking together on Article 9, if that's okay. Okay, but, but we're st we still have to dispose of Article 8 first. Okay. So. Can I stand here or should I sit down? <laughs> What's that? What's should the I, question? Should I sit down? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes, you should. Thank you. <laughs> you, could, you could also stand if you want, but, uh, just not at the podium. Um, okay, so we have a recommended vote from the select board of no action on Article 8. Um, and so we have nothing to debate here. So all those in favor of no action on Article 8 say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. And it is unanimous. We will take no action on Article 8. Uh, that takes us to Article 9. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board moved favorable action on this Warren article, and I just want to point out, uh, we, right from the beginning on our Select Board hearings, we felt this is town meeting's decision. If town meeting wants to start at 7.30, it's their choice. If they want to start at 8, um, they should decide. So we didn't want to make a recommendation. We wanted to put the vote before town meeting. At the suggestion of the town meeting procedures committee, we are moving favorable action because by doing that, there'll just be one vote. Uh, and I, I think you'll, the moderator will probably explain that to you. With that, I would like to um, invite the proponents, Ms. Kelleher and Mr. Goff, uh, to make a presentation on the article. Great, thank you. And before we take those speakers, let's switch over to the speaker queue and clear that so we have a clean slate. Okay, speaker queue is now open for folks. Uh, we'll, and we'll, after the proponents uh, speak, uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Klein, then Mr. Rosenthal. Okay, go ahead, you have seven minutes, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Krista Kelleher from Precinct 5. I filed Article 9 with the intention of having town meeting begin earlier and end earlier each evening. The traditional 11 p.m. end time seems unreasonable and has several disadvantages that are important for a democratic body to contemplate. I appreciate the thoughtful consideration of this article by Town Meeting Procedures Committee and the Select Board, as well as the moderator who offered to test several time-saving efficiencies and early adjournment votes. I am no David Letterman, and I am not fond of late nights, but I did come up with a top 10 list of reasons to support a 7.30 p.m. start time for Town Meeting. 
reading. I don't want to take up reading um, time reading the entire list, but it may be found in the annotated warrant. I will share what I deem to be most um, two of the most important reasons. The first is that town meeting members who have early morning work obligations, non-traditional work schedules, and or caregiving responsibility resp responsibilities may appreciate having an earlier end time and more time to sleep. The second is that a modified start time would affirm that traditions can adapt over time in response to changing needs and or preferences of the membership of a legislative body. I recognize that there would need to be shifts made to the scheduling of pre-town meeting meetings of the Select Board Arlington Redevelopment Board and Finance Committee to accommodate an earlier start time. These scheduling concerns are valid but not insurmountable. If town meeting determines that an earlier start time is in order, I am hopeful that such bodies could make necessary accommodations. I respectfully ask for your support of Article 9. Thank you. And I just wanted to provide some um, supplemental input uh, to Krista's testimony there. And um, obviously, uh, Article 8 was very similar to Number 9. Um, I recognized that um, after meeting with the Procedures Committee, the, the challenges of establishing a 1030 end time, but I am still very supportive of 730 as a start time, and therefore I urge support for, um, uh, for Article Number 9. And just, you know, three points I wanted to make. Uh, first of all, there was a, last December, there was a survey sent out to all town meeting members. Many of you probably um, recall that. Um, there were 154 responses to, to the question based on a preferred meeting time. And nearly 70% of, uh, of the 154 respondents um, wanted to meet earlier than 8 o'clock. Um, so it was roughly half, about half wanted to start 7 and the 10 about half of those of the 70% uh, wanted to uh, start at 7.30. So I think there's a si significant uh, desire to start earlier than eight um, is one point. Uh, second point I wanted to make, um, over the years I, and I suspect some of you perhaps, have um, tried to recruit other town meeting members when there's an opening in your precinct. Um, I've done that on a handful of occasions and uh, at times I've had challenges trying to encourage people to run for town meeting, and one thing I have heard from a number of people is just how, how late it is. Um, they like to get home earlier, get in bed far earlier than 11 o'clock, they get up early for work, they have kids, etc. cetera. Um, so I think uh, certainly from an equity point of view, one could argue, uh, I do believe a little bit earlier uh, town meeting start time and therefore likely end time, although there's no guarantee that won't be in the bylaw, um, that I think that will provide uh, perhaps a somewhat more diverse group um, of town meeting members. A third point I wanted to make is um, with town meeting uh, currently starting at eight o'clock, that's basically you know in, in late April and May, those are dusk hours. Uh, statistically, um, uh, uh, crashes involving pedestrians and bicyclists are heaviest in the evening hours, in the dusk hours. Many of us, of course, are walking and bicycling to town meeting. Uh, many of us are doing that just when it's getting dark. That's when the, there is that somewhat higher probability of crashes. I think if we are all coming to town meeting, those, who us, those of us who are walking and biking here are doing it at 7.15, 7.20, getting here at 7.30, I do believe that will um, add in just perhaps a, a, a small way um, to uh, safe and efficient uh, travel here to town meeting as well. So I thank you very much, and I do hope um, you will vote to approve um, article number nine. Thank you. Actually, actually before we take Mr. Klein, uh, I do see that Ms. Deschler is on the list, and Ms. Deschler was involved, along with Ms. Zember, were involved in conversations at the town meeting procedures committee. And so I think, so uh, if you just bear with me, we'll take Ms. Deschler first, and then Mr. Klein. Uh, since she is, uh, Ms. Deschler has weighed in on, on, on this topic and I wanted to give her an opportunity to address the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Deschler, ch the Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, as Chair of the Finance Committee, I am concerned that moving the start time to 7.30 will adversely impact my ability to get a quorum together um, for our meetings, um, which 
we hold every Monday and Wednesday night before town meeting. I'm also concerned about uh, being able to attract a, 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 a diverse, deep pool of applicants uh, for vacancies that come up. Um, as I just said, we meet every Monday and Wednesday night, or, or virtually every Monday and Wednesday night before town meeting, to discuss and take votes on things that we will have to report to town meeting on. For example, um, in, um, in order to enable the town manager additional time to bargain with some of our employee unions, the Finance Committee didn't take up our Article 64 and 65 until as recently as last week. Um, sometimes new information comes to our attention on votes that we've already taken, and we w want to revisit those votes um, and have another discussion, perhaps revote them, to give you our best recommendation. Um, if, we, if I don't have a quorum, we can't take those votes. What might end up happening is that I have to stand before you and ask that these articles be tabled for a night and that I, after I can get a quorum, which may end up prolonging the duration of the annual town meeting if, if I have to do that. Um, if town meeting starts at um, 7.30, we would have to meet at 7.00. For those people who, for example, work in Boston, can't get out of work until five o'clock, they have just two hours to navigate the MBTA, which itself can take an hour or two to get to Arlington, get home, prepare dinner, eat dinner, attend to any family obligations they have, get back and in, get into their car, drive here, park, all within two hours to be here at seven o'clock. I have already had one member say to me, they can't do that. They just know that they can't do that. Um, I am um, privileged that I work, I can work remotely on Mondays and Wednesdays, so it's less of a hardship for me. Um, for those of us who may be retired um, or don't have young children or have partners who can take care of making dinner and family obligations, um, it might be easier to adapt to a seven o'clock meeting time two days a week. Um, but that gives me concern about whether I can attract the best diverse um, pool of people who want to serve on the Finance Committee. I don't want the same type of people who are privileged to have the ability to work remotely or who, who aren't working at all or who have uh, private uh, transportation or can afford private um, childcare. I want people who, from all 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 types, all all jobs, all professions, non-professions, uh, the whole gamut. Um, uh, there's been a suggestion that perhaps the finance committee can ad can adapt and meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But many of us who are on the finance committee are town meeting members, so that would make us have to. Um, be in meetings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights for vol unpaid volunteers who have been working very hard since January, that's a big burden. Um, so I, the Finance com Committee will do whatever we need to do, whatever you decide, um, but I just want the body to understand the potential ramifications if this meeting shifts to 7.30. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take Mr. Klein. And uh, Ms. Deschler's comments notwithstanding, uh, complaints about the MBTA are not in scope. Mr. Slickman. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Uh, Mr. Moderator, does this change apply directly to every night of town meeting or only to the first night? Yes and no. Uh, I can clarify. The, um, the Article 9 applies only to, technically, to the first night of town meeting because that's what's specified in the town bylaws in Title I, Article I, Section 1. However, the expectation of the current select board chair and the current moderator is that we would uh, uh, pursue consistency across nights of town meeting and would use that uh, as the new precedent going forward for nights of town meeting. Thank you. Um, when the chairman of the select board stands up at the start of every session and makes a uh, 
a motion that the board, that should the meeting not be adjourned at a certain time, that we adjourn to a date and time specific. Is that a debatable motion? It is. Is it an amendable motion? It is. So if there is a, a time that is given for the start of town meeting, and town meeting to, would rather start at a different time at the next session, that is debatable and it's amendable. So if I personally prefer the eight o'clock time, it allows me to participate in other activities uh, that I do here in town. Um, I'm a scoutmaster of a troop. It would basically mean two months that I can't meet with my troop. Um, if we do this where I have to change their schedule uh, to accommodate mine. Um, and I have been talking with the moderator earlier this meeting about having a session where we started at 7.30 just to try it out and see how it works. Um, unfortunately, every single Monday and Wednesday, we have either the F Finance Committee, the Redevelopment Board, or the Select Board is meeting and doing this town's business so that we can meet at eight o'clock and have before us everything we need to have before us for that night. And so uh, with that, I strongly encourage uh, that we maintain our current practice of 8 p.m. Thank you. All right, thank you. And let's see, Mr. Rosenthal next. And while Ms. Mr. Rosenthal is coming up, I just wanna point out that uh, while it is technically according to town meeting time, amendable and debatable, like what time we adjourn to, uh, that we wanna avoid a chaotic situation where folks can't plan ahead, and so uh, we want some sort of consistency so folks can actually attend town meeting. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Mr. Moderator, uh, you just said that this motion is amendable, but uh, unless I misunderstand, amendments have to be into you 24 hours, I'm sorry, 48 hours prior to, uh, prior to the night that they're voted on, so how can an amendment, uh, you know, have any meaningful effect? Uh, so first of all, there, there, is, there is no longer a 48-hour rule. It's been replaced with, um, uh, well, there, there's three options for submitting amendments uh, or, or subsidiary motions. Um, and this, and so this would fall under uh, an amendment. Uh, those options are submitting it in advance and it needs to be far enough in advance that it can be reviewed and approved by me. Uh, and published uh, uh, or uh, announced through the TMM email list by 5 p.m. of the business day before the meeting. So it, it's, a, uh, it's an evolution of the 48-hour rule. It's derivative of it, but it's not exactly 48 hours anymore. And um, uh, there, are other, there are two other options for offering uh, uh, subsidiary motions at the meeting. Uh, one, the, the second one is uh, uh, that someone can print their own copies and put it in the back and there just won't be any advance notice. But I would need a copy before that meeting to know that that amendment exists uh, so that I can call someone up to offer it. Uh, and then the third option is motions from the floor, which are within roughly 20 words. Uh, and so this would easily fall into the third category. Thank you. Um... It strikes me that this uh, has ripple effects that haven't been considered and that have just been addressed by uh, Representative Klein and um, I, am, I apologize, but uh, the speaker who spoke before uh, Representative Klein, uh, I'm sorry. Ms. Deschler. Ms. Ms. Deschler. Um, and we just, recently had an example that I assume everybody is aware of where uh, the select board wanted to meet an hour and a half in advance of town meeting, which meant that the uh, Human Rights Commission could not meet then, so they had to move their, um, their meeting to an hour prior to that, which meant that uh, it started 5.30, this uh, m moving, moving the meeting time up a half an hour um, is going to move, is, is going to have the ripple effect that all meetings prior to that will meet a half an hour before they otherwise would. And that means that people who don't have the privilege of working from home um, 
will almost certainly find it difficult, if not impossible, to attend the earlier meetings, um, and thus we're creating a group that will be disenfranchised. So I would argue against changing the time. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have other speakers have the, that we selected? Um, let's see, uh, Pi Fisher and then Mr. Newton. Do we have the uh, microphone? Okay. Pi Fisher, Precinct 6, motion to terminate debate. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. Uh, debate is not terminated. One, two, three, four, five. Let's take an electronic vote. Okay, voting is now open for terminating debate. If you want to terminate debate, press one for yes. If you want to continue debate, press two for no, or three to abstain. Five seconds left. Okay, let's close voting. This is a two thirds vote. And the motion passes, 145 in the affirmative, 36 in the negative. See, those no's are really loud. Um, okay, so uh, we'll go straight to a vote on the main motion. And this is a majority vote. We're voting on the select board's recommended vote of uh, uh, favorable action on uh, changing the start time of town meeting from, uh, from 8 o'clock in the evening to 7.30 in the evening. If you're in favor, uh, so let's bring up voting on that. It's technically for the, yes, so voting is now open. Uh, if you're in favor of the change in the town bylaws, uh, that's the first paragraph, last sentence of the first paragraph of the town bylaws, that the annual town meeting starts uh, uh, at eight o'clock in the evening on the first night. Uh, if you wanna change that to 7.30 in the evening, press one for yes. If you wanna leave it at eight o'clock, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, and voting will be open for a few more seconds. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails, 58 in the affirmative, 120 in the negative, nine abstentions. Um, that brings us to Article 10. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board recommends favorable action on Article 10, and this is d designed to address a situation that came up this year where the, the Article 1, Section 1 of our bylaw says that the town meeting shall start on the fourth Monday in April. Uh, this year, the fourth Monday in April was the first night of Passover. And while there is a statute that allowed us to move the date, we felt with the recommendation of town council that we should put the flexibility to move the date by February 1st in the bylaw so that future select boards don't have to search for chapter 39, uh, section nine. Um, so just really allowed to give that flexibility provided that notice is given by February 1st. Okay, thank you. And um, something I forgot to do, let's, uh, let's just switch over to the speaker queue. And let's clear that. Okay. So we'll start with Mr. Hamlin and then Pi Fisher. Guillermo Hamlin, Precinct 14. I move to terminate debate in all matters before it. So. Before I recognize that motion, I have a question for you, Mr. Hamlin. Uh, did you comment 
on debate? No. You did not. And the town bylaws say that you can't do that when you terminate debate, correct? No. Therefore, debate has not started. I'm confused. I'm, <laughs> um, all right. Clarification. Pie Fisher? Okay, we All have right, no one to you. speak on this, so Mr. Lewitton. Mr. Lewitton, did you want to speak? The debate hasn't started until someone speaks. Marvin Lewitton, Precinct 16, I'm speaking. We could do this all night. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jaspin, you could just not enter the speaker queue. Uh, uh, Barry Jaspin, Precinct 18. This really isn't that hard, folks. Select Board, thank you very much for moving the first night of town meeting this time away from the first night of Passover. I really appreciated it. That's all. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, town meeting just voted not to change the start time of town meeting. Now we have an article before us with a positive vote that gives the select board the authority to change the starting time of town meeting. Um, it's a start, start well, date. As I read the language, it says both the time and the date. Does it not? Did, anyone read, the, did anyone read the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen? Okay, what does it say about changing the time and what are the implications of that, Mr. Moderator? Thank you. Okay, can we bring up the vote language? Okay, that's, we have to scroll down. Um, can, can we see the, Yeah, can we scroll to the bottom where we see the underlined text at the bottom of a paragraph? Yeah. And so the text that it would add to the end of the first paragraph of the town bylaws, uh, which we've been fixated on tonight, is unless the select board votes not later than February 1st to establish another date and time in order to better suit the public convenience for reasons it shall determine, including but not limited to conflicts, so on and so on, um, and in no case shall the annual town meeting begin later than the second Monday in May at eight o'clock in the evening. That eight o'clock is the latest time that it could start. Uh, so I believe uh, Mr. Loretti is correct that the select board would have the authority uh, to uh, establish another date and time in order to better suit the public convenience. Uh, Mr. Falanke? Ratnakar Velanki, Precinct 7, motion to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. Um, all those in favor of terminating debate say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. Debate is terminated. So. We bring up a vote on the main motion. This is a majority vote. Point of order, Mr. Rosenthal. Let's hold off on opening voting until we hear the point of order. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Um, when we were voting on Article 9, or prior to voting on that, um, you, uh, Mr. Moderator, you gave an explanation as to why this would likely apply or why, why that article would likely apply to all starting times for all sessions of the uh, of town meeting. With this article, the language seems to me to be uh, different, and it seems like it would only apply to uh, the very first session. 
Uh, but, but this is a question about the but, bottom line is interpretation I, I, of I don't the understand amendment. exactly what this would do, and I'd like to have a more solid understanding of what it will do uh, before I vote on it. So my question is simply, will this apply only to the very first session of town meeting or will it apply to all sessions of town meeting? That, Mr. Rosenthal, that would be an appropriate question during debate, but debate is now terminated. And we have the, the, we have the text here. Uh, so now that debate is terminated, everyone uh, needs to use their, their best judgment about what, uh, how to interpret this text. Okay, voting is now open on the main motion of Article 10. This is a majority vote, so if you're in favor of changing, uh, 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 amending the town bylaws, that first paragraph, uh, by adding that text that allows the, the select board uh, uh, to change the start uh, date and time, press one for yes. If you're opposed to that change to the town bylaws, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 164 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative. Um, it is an affirmative vote. So Article 10 is now disposed of, and that brings us now back to the natural sequence of articles at Article 31. Um, let's see, Mr. Revelak, did you want to lead us off here? Mr. Benson will. Uh, Ms. Zemberry, the chair of the Redevelopment Board, is, uh, is not here tonight, and Mr. Benson will introduce uh, Article 31. Thank you, Eugene Benson, Redevelopment Board. Article 31 is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment to add the lot at 5 to 7 Winter Street to the multifamily housing overlay district. It was filed by John Leone. The board was split four to one on their support of this article. All ARB members felt that while the town made a specific effort to exclude properties on the National Historic Register and those of local historic importance as per the recommendation of the MBTA Communities Working Group, there should not be an issue with individual owners who seek to add their property to the multifamily overlay district to preserve their right to redevelop their property similar to those directly abutting neighbors. The ARB member who opposed agreed to the merit of the inclusion of the property in the district, but felt that the required legal notice for the map change had not been made. The ARB voted four to one at our April 1 meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 31. Okay, and uh, Mr. Leone has a presentation, but before we take Mr. Leone, let's switch to the speaker queue. And uh, let's just, okay. Oh, okay, this is the speaker queue we have now. Okay, uh, Mr. Leone. And we can switch back to Mr. Leone's slide deck. Good evening, John Leone, Precinct 8. I also have a, um, an amendment, Mr. Moderator. Yep. We have a slight amendment. Um, First, I have to start off saying that I do have a financial interest. I'm here with my sister, Suzanne, who is the co-trustee of the AML Realty Trust that owns this property. This property has been in our family since 1957, I believe. Last year, Arlington, we approved the MBTA Multifamily Neighborhood Districts, which allowed owners of parcels to build multi-floor apartment buildings in the district. Um, next slide, please. Tonight we're asking that you include our build, building, our property, within the neighborhood multifamily district. Next slide, please. This is a, you probably can't read it too well because it's tiny. This is the, all the par parcels, parcels that are included in the MBTA district in East Arlington. We are not included in there. Next slide, please. Five to seven Winter Street, hold on. Our home was admitted from the multifamily neighborhood district, sub-district, by the Arlington Redevelopment Board. The rationale was that it was on the historic building list of the National Historic Register. Next slide, please. However, numbers 13 Winter Street, as well as 15 Winter Street, 
which are both included in the NM NMF, are also historic buildings listed on the National Historic Register. Next slide, please. This is a little bit of slide, it's more close up. This slide you can see, our house is, our parcel is the L-shaped parcel that extends behind the other two parcels. Further down Winter Street, there are two large parcels. Those are 13 and 15. They are included. Next slide, please. This is a little better slide. Our lot is in blue. The other, dis other parcels in red are all included in the district, except for obviously Mass Ave. Those are um, business districts. They're gonna get rezoned at some point in the future to allow multi-story buildings. And in the corner of Cleveland Street is the Fox Library, which the town is actively exploring to go up and make multi-story housing. Our parcel is the first one on Winter Street from Mass Ave and directly abuts that row of commercial Mass Ave um, taxpayers, as I call them, because they're commercial buildings. They sit directly across from the Summit House of Condominium Building, the abutting parcels of 9 Winter Street, 11 Winter Street, 13 Winter Street, as well as 15, all on the same side of, are on the, in the district, so too is 14 Winter Street down the street on the other side. Um, next slide, please. This one you can see in a different view. This is a different overhead view of the actual aerial map that shows our parcel. You can see how large it is. It's one of the largest parcels in East Arlington. That's one of the reasons we'd like it to be included. Um, the un next slide, please. The unintended consequences. If each of the included parcels listed above were to construct multifamily buildings to the allowed limit, as the town is now contemplating for the Fox Library, the five to seven Winter Street parcel would be surrounded by multi-floor apartment buildings and it would never be able to add on to the existing building nor build it out or replace it with an apartment building of any sort. Not that we have any plans to do that. We would never be able to have a similar structure as would be allowed and possibly built up all around us. This would be despite its large size, it would forever be locked in as an R2, a two-family home. Next slide, please. A future owner may someday wish to subdivide the rear portion of the property for the benefit of allowing our neighbors, the abutters, to increase their lot size so they could build larger multifamily homes. This would not be allowed without an amendment to add our parcel to the map and to the list. Next slide, please. The request is not, the request to include five to seven Winter Street is not a personal privilege. It is about a fair and equitable application of the MBTA community law. We brought this request to the ARB after several meetings and two widespread mailings which we sent to over 300 people, um, no, over 180 people within a 300 foot radius about the ARB meetings and another mailing for all our direct abutters, we only got two responses. And both of those people were inquiring what the MBTA district was all about and whether or not they were included. No one had any specific questions about our property. Between my sister Suzanne and I, we attended the majority of um, precinct meetings and fielded a few questions, but none of them had to do with the actual amendment that we're seeking. Um, after the ARB voted to approve the five to seven Winter Street in the district, our amendment made at the recommendation of the, uh, we, ah, we've made an amendment. The um, recommended vote of the ARB includes our parcel on the MBTA district list. As you remember during the special town meeting a few nights ago, we had to ad adopt the map so our amendment is also made to add this parcel to the list as well as the map so that we are in conformance with the Attorney General's requirements about the map. So that's, Mr. Cunningham had asked that I make this amendment, which is why we have an amendment. And do you, do you want to move that amendment? I see that. Um, 
Yeah, so at this point, we ask that you vote in favor of the amendment as well as the main motion of the ARB. And if you have any questions, we'll be standing right over here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leonard, do you want to move your amendment? I don't, know if we, I don't think we got a second on that. I, make, I move my amendment. Can I have a second? Second. It is now Thank pending you. before us. Thank you. Okay, and then from the speaker queue, uh, I'll take, um, let's see, we just heard from Ms. Garber, so we'll take Mr. Wagner and then Ms. Carlton Keeson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Uh, Joanne Robinson, chair of the Arlington Historical Commission, was hoping to be here tonight and to speak to you. Uh, she couldn't make it. But what I would like to pass on from her is that um, there are only about 45 properties in Arlington that are on the caliber of the Leone property. Uh, these are houses that we don't just want to lose in Arlington to make multifamily housing. We don't want to lose across the United States. They represent something that is being lost when not protected. And currently, because properties like these 45 are not in historic districts, 12 months is all that would be left if the Leones or other owners were to sell to developers before the delay of demolition went through. Um, I hope that next year uh, Ms. Robinson is able to convince uh, the select board or the appropriate body and you that uh, in situations like this, uh, developers should work with uh, the owners or the town, the historical commission, to find a good solution. And I believe that Ms. Robinson has um, achieved uh, uh, some measure of understanding from the Leones that they're not planning to sell this right now. So the property is not immediately going to be lost. And we hope that if the property were sold, as there's a very nice large back area, perhaps uh, the developers and the Leones or the future owners would find a way to preserve such a wonderful physical structure. Um, I also represent sometimes Arlington Residents for Responsible Redevelopment. And last year, I and members of ARFR, Arlington Residents, um, to the Leone's dismay, said that uh, this should not happen. Their property should not be included in the MBTA density overlay. But in looking at what happened, you could see their property is surrounded due to, I think, the inappropriate working of the working group. Uh, and it seems a fairness issue now. So I have changed my opinion, and I think members of ARFR have changed their opinion, but it doesn't mean that properties like theirs should be included if the working group hadn't chosen to include other historical properties. We really have to work to save what history we have here, as well as to find a way to have cheaper and more affordable housing, not luxury condos. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take Ms. Carlton Giesen and then Ms. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Betsy Carlton Giesen, Precinct 9. Um, I just have a couple of questions that, um, as uh, we had discussed during the precinct meeting, Mr. Leone, um, I have some concerns about an individual parcel coming up before the entirety of town meeting. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, and this is the second time that it has come before this body. Uh, and, you know, as opposed to my question being about the merits of this particular lot, um, I'm wondering about whether this is really the most appropriate place to deal with this. And you had mentioned that there were other uh, parcels within Arlington that were facing similar issues. And I wondered if you had done any outreach to try to find those other owners to find some sort of communal address to fix it rather than have it be just a one-off for this particular parcel. Is there a question for Mr. Mr. Leone? Yep. John Leone, Precinct 8, thank you. Um, you know, this is actually the only body that can address it. That's why we've come back. Mm -hmm. Last year, the ARB voted against the article because we hadn't presented to them first, was my understanding. This year we went through the process. Mm -hmm. And as to the specific question, if, have we reached out to other owners? No, we have not. There's, um, although we have tried, there's no way to cross-reference the houses on the National Historic Register with the houses on the um, multifamily neighborhood district lists. Mm -hmm. They're both closed list. We're not computer experts. I think AI might be able to figure it out, but not <laughs> us. 
Um, so I haven't yeah. reached out to any other owners. Um, and frankly, I wouldn't presume to w act on their behalf without them coming forward to me. Some mm -hmm. people have come forward to me, but their parcels are not in the district as ours is surrounded by district parcels. Thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess, so then theoretically we could end up with a number of these one-offs coming to us individually in an future town meetings, is that correct? I wouldn't speak to that. I mean, Mr. Mr. Cunningham, coming, Cunningham an answer. Ask, answer that question. I generally trust Mr. Cunningham over AI so far. Don't speak too soon, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. There's nothing procedurally inappropriate about what Mr. Leone has done here. And yes, I guess the, in, in, to follow that logic, uh, others could come forward with similar bylaw amendments. Okay, then I guess um, a more fitting question then might be, uh, is there an opportunity to create some sort of a remedy that would make it so that these didn't have to be addressed individually and have that come before us instead? Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, the, coming up with an alternate remedy would really be outside the scope of this article. Okay, I just wondered if there was a... Yeah. Okay. And I'm curious, when you say that you wouldn't be able to sell off any of the pieces of land, what precludes you from being able to sell off pieces of your land and then, because they would be part of those parcels, have the rules that relate to those parcels? Mr. Leone? Thank you, John Leone. We could... Yes, we could subdivide the rear portion, the L of our mm -hmm. property, but those particular little parcels that we cut off would still be zoned R2. Mm -hmm. Just because they are now attached, owned by a family in a, the neighborhood multifamily district, that subparcel is not in the district. It has to be included by a vote of town meeting in the entire district. It doesn't automatically get the zoning um, imprimata that the owner has on his or her property. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Ms. Friedman next and then Mr. Greenspawn. Uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. I have a question concerning this property because your home is an historical building um, why are you trying to get this remedy as opposed to subdividing your lot and then just requesting that the portion that does not contain your house um, be made part of the multifamily district? I mean, I would certainly be in favor of that if that was the way you approached it. Yeah, Mr. Leone, this is, this is getting to the edge of scope, but I'll allow it. We're seeking this remedy. Oh, thank you again for your question. But we're seeking this remedy because if that home is huge, it, but it is interior, it is very inefficiently designed. You could get a good interior designer who could redesign that interior to a three family. We could extend the back of the building out 20, 30 feet and still be within the zoning um, setbacks, not affecting the front of the building, the facade that we all see and love but we wouldn't be able to do that because it's an R2. We wouldn't be able to incorporate the barn in the back and, and, and somehow make that apartments because it's an R2. So the only, in our opinion, the only logical thing here is to have it included in the district to expand the potential for housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenspawn and then Mr. Palmer. Andy Greenspawn, Precinct 5. I move to terminate debate on all articles before us. All articles? Sorry. All, all, this, this motion and all subsidiary motions. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. We have a motion to terminate debate on Article 31 and all matters before it, and a second. All those in favor of terminating debate uh, say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. Debate is terminated. So we will first take a vote on the Leone Amendment. Uh, which you should all have a copy of. Um, it basically inserts uh, a paragraph into the vote language to make sure that it updates both the parcel list and the map. Okay, so voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Leone Amendment, to add that paragraph, press one for yes. 
If you're opposed to that amendment, press two for no. And three to abstain. Five seconds to vote. Let's close voting. And the amendment passes. 165 in the affirmative, 16 in negative, two abstentions. So we now have a main motion as amended. So we'll now take a vote on the main motion. Just waiting for the main motion vote to open. I see lots of folks entering the speaker queue and voting is now open. All those in favor of the main motion under Article 31 as amended by the Leone Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no to keep the zoning bylaws and, and maps and parcel lists intact without change. And three to abstain. Okay, voting is now closed. And it is a majority vote, it is affirmative. 156 in the affirmative, 28 in the negative, four abstentions. And that takes us to Article 32. We have a motion to adjourn and a very quick uh, assertive second. All those in favor of adjourning say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. We are adjourned until Wednesday at 8 p.m. See you then, everyone. Oh, wait, a a a any? Notices of reconsideration on 17. We have a notice for reconsideration on 17. Okay. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.